And Father, we thank you again that we know your amazing grace. We thank you that our chains are gone, that we've been set free. That Christ bore our sin in his body, taking your wrath upon the tree. That we who were enslaved to sin, darkness, and death have been set free. Father, as we continue to worship, now through the reading of your word and our response to it, may you be pleased. As we continue to worship by entering your presence through your son to spend moments of intimate fellowship and prayer, may you be honored. God, we pray that as we leave here tonight, all glory and praise will be to the Father. Amen. I'm a Batman fan. Maybe that feels like a bit of a confession there, but I'm, I'm a Batman guy. I like Captain America, but before there was Captain America for me, there was Batman. And before there was cool Batman, there was Adam West Batman. You know, you never wanted to wear that outfit for Halloween. But I remember watching Adam West and Burt Ward on the television series of Batman and Robin. There was often many of their villains that they would fight against. One of those being the Riddler, who would often speak to them in riddles and start that with, riddle me this. So tonight, friends... How about you riddle me this? I have a riddle for you. It'll be on the screen. I'll read it for us. A little participation here. If you think you've got a good answer at the end of the riddle, I'd love to hear it out loud for everybody to hear. I am your constant companion. I'm your greatest helper or your heaviest burden. I will push you onward or drag you down to failure. I am completely at your command. Half of the things you do, you might as well turn over to me, and I will be able to do them quickly and correctly. I'm easily managed. You must merely be firm with me. Show me exactly how you want something done, and after a few lessons, I'll do it for you automatically. I am the servant of all great people and, alas, of all failures as well. Those who are great, I have made great. I am not a machine, though I work with the precision of a machine plus the intelligence of a man. You may run me for profit or run me for ruin. It really makes no difference to me. Take me, train me, be firm with me, and I will place the world at your feet. Be easy with me, and I will destroy you. Who am I? All right, this is a timid class tonight, friends. Now look, there's an answer. This is not my riddle. I didn't write it. I didn't come up with it. But I don't know that I would have gotten it had I not known the answer from the beginning. What do you think? Attitude, okay. It's a good answer, yes. Worry, oh, oh, good, yeah. Those are two good answers. Conscience. Discipline. Who said discipline? Discipline. <laughs> oh, you'll find out soon. <laughs> Somebody else? Your tongue. Ooh. Oof. All right now, Winnie. I'm feeling all sorts of conviction right now. But Oh, you want to go back? Can we previous slide that? Constant companion. I'm your greatest helper, your heaviest burden. I will push you onward or drag you down to failure. I'm completely at your command. Half the things you do, you might as well turn over to me, and I will be able to do them quickly and correctly. I am easily managed. You must merely be firm with me. 
show me exactly how you want something done, and after a few lessons, I'll do it for you automatically. I'm the servant of all great people, and alas, of all failures as well. Those who are great, I have made great. I'm not a machine, though I work with the precision of a machine plus the intelligence of a man. You may run me for profit or run me for ruin. It really makes no difference to me. Take me, train me, be firm with me, and I will place the world at your feet. Be easy with me, and I will destroy you. (laughs) That's a great answer. Would you tell that to my boys? who are begging for a dog. In this riddle, which I didn't come up with that, was, that I came across, the answer is, I am habit. I am habit. Nathaniel Emmons keenly wrote, habit is the best of servants or the worst of masters. Habit. We started last week looking at the prayer life of Jesus, and we did that in Genesis where there were all of these names being given, but then there was one group who began to call upon the name of all names, the name of Yahweh. Jesus is the name above all names. God's name is the name above all names because it is a reflection of who he is and what he has done. And as we step now into the New Testament, Jesus, fully God and fully human, descended into the lower parts out of heaven to this earth. And even in his earthly ministry, he cultivated this discipline of prayer. He developed and practiced a habit of prayer. The Son of God. In human flesh, completely perfect, never knowing not one hint of sin, had a habit of prayer. In Luke chapter 5, verse 16, Luke says that Jesus would often slip away to a desolate place and pray. It doesn't say, and on this day he did it. Luke says he often did this. You read the gospel accounts and you'll find moments of Jesus praying for you may not even have recognized he was praying. We get so stuck on the fact that Jesus took five loaves and two fish and was about to feed a multitude of people that we fail to stop and see and he prayed before they ate. He grabbed hold of those things, and looking to the heavens, he prayed. Even after the resurrection, when he was walking with two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and they didn't know who he was, and they said, it's too far gone into the evening. You don't need to keep traveling. Come into the house and stay with us. And they began to eat bread, and it says, and he began to bless and break. He was praying. He was giving thanks. And in that moment, what's interesting, their eyes were open and they knew him. Jesus was often praying, alone and in groups, perhaps out loud and sometimes without even words, but it was his habit to pray. And it was a good habit. If you Google search about habits, you find a lot about bad habits. But the truth of the matter is, is that habits are either good or bad. They either serve a noble purpose or a poor, unworthy purpose. But Jesus cultivated this habit of prayer. And in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, I want us to look at this place where Jesus slips away to go pray. His habit was to pray. And in this moment, Mark tells us that he did at the very beginning of his earthly ministry on one notable occasion, slip away and go pray. 
You know, what's interesting that I didn't really notice because I take the gospel so often collectively is that Mark actually only records three times that Jesus prays. But this is the first of those. What I want us to do in Mark chapter 1, verses 35 through 39, is read and look at this habit of Jesus to pray and how Jesus prioritized prayer and what it meant for him. We will be easily able to take some personal application from this. For even though he was the son of God in human flesh, completely perfect without sin, the fact that Jesus had a habit of praying and disciplining himself to pray reminds us that we need that discipline and habit in our own life. And the fact that we're going to have to prioritize it over some things just as Jesus did is application for us. And what I want us to do just to give you the forecast here. It's a good forecast, not like it's going to be in 20 degree temperatures this week in Beaumont, but this is the good forecast. With each point, I want us to talk about it, see it from the text, and then I'm going to stop. And I'm just going to invite you to go before the throne of God and to pray in application of this particular part. We're going to do that with each of the four and then we'll get into our groups and pray for one another, for the needs of our church body, and for the glory of God to be revealed in and through us. So chapter 1 of Mark's gospel, beginning in verse 35, Mark says, And rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, well, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. Jesus got up early. He headed out of the house while it was still early in the morning, and he departed to a desolate place, and there he prayed. Jesus had a habit of prayer. He cultivated this discipline to pray. But this life of prayer was a priority for him, which meant that it took place over other things. You see, for something to be a priority, that means something else gets rooted out of the place of priority. Like, you don't have two first priorities in your life. You have first priority and second priority, but they're not equal in priority. So for you to have a priority means something else is not ultimate priority. And Jesus, to have a habit of prayer meant that this had to be in place in his life so some other things at times did not get a place in his life which means if you and I are going to have the habit of prayer in our life that means this has to be in its place and some other things will not have its place maybe they will get less time maybe they'll get less place or maybe they'll just re be replaced altogether. For, but for Jesus, to prioritize prayer, what got replaced? Number one, Jesus prioritized prayer over personal comfort. If ever there was a, a danger, a temptation... Something that the American church could easily find replacing God, it's our personal comfort. The air conditioner goes out, we can't come worship. The Cowboys might be in a playoff game. Well, never mind, I'm sorry. Bad illustration. 
but if the cowboys are on, I, I'm, uh, God, I'll, uh, I'll pray for the food. I'll pray for the chips and the dip. But then we're going to eat and watch some football. Notice what it says, and rising very early in the morning. Eckhard Schnabel says that the word that's used here, speaking of this time of the morning, means that it was between 3 and 6 a.m. No, notice, it's almost like you're thinking, well, Mark, we get the point. It was very early. You didn't have to tell us that it was while it was still dark. But Mark wants us to know this isn't like it was early, but the sun was about to rise. No, it was early, and it was still dark, and the sun wasn't going to be coming up for a bit. Jesus prioritized prayer over the personal comfort of sleep. I struggle with that. I like me some sleep. I like a nap on Sunday afternoon. In fact, it's been reported to me that in the interim time here that Mike Dean said that a nap was worship and spiritual. Amen. I'm going to have to use that. I like what Jerry Vines once said about his sermons. He said, man, I milk a lot of cows, but I make my own butter. I'm going to use that. I'm going to be like, hey, Mike Dean said, and this is good. I like sleep. But Jesus didn't sleep. He prayed. Because if prayer was going to be a priority, some of his own personal comfort was going to be sacrificed and given up. But don't miss in the context how significant this is. I mean, Sarah will tell you, I'm grateful to God that he would use somebody like me. I know who I am and where I've been. I know my present failure still. And I'm grateful that God lets me open his word and preach and teach the eternal truth of God. But I'm telling you what, it is like nothing I've ever done before when I'm finished. Like I feel like I got hit by the Mack truck and then got caught up underneath on the undercarriage, drugged down the road for five miles, then a stampede of longhorns crossed over top of me, and then somebody picked me up and threw me in a bed. Y'all are like, where's this going? Sunday afternoons when I finish preaching, man, I love some sleep. I, I just do. Give me a nap. In fact, I'm pretty good for about an hour after I preach, which is, is why I can usually finish a service and I can talk to you in an intelligent manner and maybe have lunch where you and I are there together. But at some point, like, I'm shutting down. It's like there's this beeping sound in my head, like battery depleted, battery depleted, battery depleted. If you go back and read what happens in verses 29 to 34, Jesus just spent the previous day ministering to the masses. It says that Jesus has begun his earthly ministry. He's been teaching in the synagogue. He goes and heals Simon's mother-in-law. And that evening at sundown, that's important. Because there's no street lamps. There's no cars with headlights. People usually worked sun up to sundown. And at sundown, you get in your house, you hunker down for the night. And so just when maybe Jesus was thinking, good, good, good. They're all going to go home. They're all going to leave me alone. I'm going to get to sleep. It says, and at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Not the whole city, but it's a, it's a hyperbolic statement that indicates that it was such a throng of people that it seemed like the entire city was coming. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases, and he cast out many demons. We don't know how long this went on. So in truth, I'm not trying to read more into the scripture, but it started at sundown. And it could have lasted for hours. We don't even know if Jesus got to go to bed that night. Before he left the house and went to pray. But prayer was such a priority to him that he would sacrifice his own personal comfort of sleep. But there was more. 
he sacrificed not only his personal comfort of sleep, but notice that he sacrificed his own personal comfort of a hard location. He got up, departed, and went to a desolate place. That word desolate place that, that is used here is the same thing, same word, when it speaks of John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness, the desolate place. It's the same word that refers to Jesus being driven and led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan, the desolate place. You see, I'm okay. I got to give up some sleep. I'm going to pray, but I'm going to run by Starbucks. I'll probably get me a white chocolate mocha and a scone. I'll find me a really comfortable chair, and I'm going to sit down and I'm going to pray. But where is Jesus? In a hard place, a desolate place, perhaps even you could say it a dangerous place. Animals, wild animals. But Jesus sacrifices his own personal comfort by choosing to be in a desolate place. And perhaps he chose that place so that he would not be interrupted nor distracted. But it goes beyond that. And while it was still early in the morning and it was still dark, he departed and went to a desolate place and there he prayed. He sacrificed the personal comfort of a crowd, of other people. Well, they're not doing it. Why should I have to do it? If they're not doing it, I can wait and take somebody with me later. Because if I'm going to do it, they can do it. Or, or we can be there to encourage each other. Sometimes doing the thing that is a habit of discipline for the glory of God means that we're standing alone and doing it by ourselves, seemingly. And that's what Jesus did. His personal comfort was not going to be his priority his communication with the Father was going to be the priority. His intimate fellowship with the Father. So is there a personal comfort that's keeping you and me from our habits, our godly habits of following Jesus? And more specifically, is there some personal comfort that's keeping you and me from prayer with the Father? And this is where we take our first pause. And this is what we go to the Father to talk about right now. Maybe you're not even sure. So maybe your prayer in this moment should be, Lord, search me. See if there is any wicked way in me. Is there something that is of greater treasure to me? Is there some comfort that's a really a roadblock that I'm not willing to give that up? to follow you, to be with you, to do what you say. Maybe you already know that there's something. and You can just confess that to God and ask that he would help you to have a cultivated life of discipline to pray and to not let that thing, that comfort, stand in your way. Let's pray together. I'm going to give you just a few moments here of silence where not even the sound of my voice would be a distraction to you. Let me invite you to talk with the Father about the priorities in your life and whether personal comfort is standing in the way. Father, we do pray that there would be nothing that comforts us more than to be in your presence and to do your will that we would find our own hearts to be restless until we enjoy those sacred moments of intimate fellowship and communion with you in prayer and to read and to obey your word. God, help us to see where we have elevated our own personal comfort, that we've become hedonists, our own pleasure, 
has become the God that so often rules our life, our habits, and what we do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus not only prioritized prayer over his own personal comfort, but he prioritized prayer over life's demands. Notice that the disciples here come to him in verse 36. At some point, they finally woke up. Probably the sun came up and they awakened to a new day. And as they got up, they recognized that Jesus was missing. And they're not really sure where he's gone. Because when he went to pray, he didn't wake anybody up to tell them that he was going. This wasn't like, hey, y'all, I'm super spiritual Jesus here going out for a prayer at 3 a.m. He just left and went to pray. And so they wake up and Jesus is missing. And so they look for him. We'll come back to that in a moment. But it says that Simon and those who were with him. Interesting that Mark doesn't refer to Simon Peter as the lead of the apostles disciples or an apostle and he also doesn't refer to the ones with him as disciples perhaps because they weren't acting very disciple-like in this moment they finally find Jesus and their words to him is everyone is looking for you who's everyone who might they be referring to I, I hear mumble Who do you think the everyone is referring to? Okay, so the disciples are looking for him. Those who are looking for healing. Remember what happened the night before. So the disciples are clearly looking for him because Simon and those who were with him, probably referring to the, the other disciples, they're out searching for him. But they didn't say, hey, we were looking for you, though they were. They said, everyone's looking for you. Well, who's everyone? Probably the town, because you see what happened the night before. Jesus was healing and casting out demons, and it was like the whole city was coming. But then finally, it got so late and people went home, but the next morning at the first opportunity, people were up. They were out of the house. They were coming to find the healer, the miracle worker. Everyone's looking for you. Everyone's looking for you. Don't you know there's work to be done? Everybody's looking for you. Don't you know that they've drugged all the sick people and they're laying them outside the house? Demon-possessed people are running around trying to run through the wall of the house. Everybody's looking for you. There is work to be done. How could you be out here in a desolate place doing whatever it is that you're doing, having a super spiritual moment like a monk? How could you be here? There's work to be done. Isn't there always work to be done? The disciples are essentially saying, Jesus' life has some demands. There is work to be done. Why aren't you doing the work? Jesus could have easily reprimanded them in this moment and said, I am doing the work. I love Oswald Chambers' words about prayer. He said, prayer is not fitting us for greater works. Prayer is the greater work. Jesus could have easily said that to them. Hey, look, I know that you think that there's work to be done, and there is. And you think that it's great work to be done, and it is. But I'm doing the greater work because I've been out here since early this morning spending time with my Father. Prayer took a priority over life's demands the work that had to be done, the work that maybe should be done, the work that others were saying had to get done. And you're always going to have work to be done. You're always going to have other people telling you, hey, look, these things have to be done. And it'll be very easy to look at the work that has to be done and say, I don't have time to pray. As one pastor once said it, we don't have time not to pray. Well, I don't have time to pray. No, you don't have time not to pray. And so it is that Jesus prioritized prayer over the demands that maybe life was throwing at him. 
and that's me. Not that, I get, not, not that I prioritize prayer over the demands. It's that I argue I have so much to do, God. And it's all good stuff that you've given to me. I, I just, I don't, I don't have the time. No, Jesus says a habit of prayer means that you will prioritize it over the demands of life. It doesn't mean that you shirk your responsibilities. This is not like, well, I can't go to work because I have to pray. I can't feed my family because I have to pray. I can't go to church and serve because I have to pray. This is not that answer. This is, we must find a way to fulfill the God-given duties and responsibilities while not also shirking our duty and responsibility to be in prayer with the Father. So what demand of life has kept you from your godly habits? What responsibility or work in life has kept you from a consistent time of prayer with the Father? This is where we pause for our second time of going to the Father and saying, Oh God, forgive us. And help me not to elevate this work, this responsibility, this duty, this this other thing, this this hobby, anything else that maybe life throws out there to elevate it over you. Let's pray together. Father, we know that you've given us work to do. But may our work never replace the greater work of being in your presence to know and to do the will of our Father in heaven. Let us, Father, prioritize prayer as the greater work. And when life throws its demands at us, let perhaps that moment of feeling overwhelmed and as though we have too much to do be a reminder that that may very well be the exact moment to stop and to pray maybe it's not an hour long prayer but we stop and acknowledge that before we do all the work before us we need you most of all may we prioritize prayer over the demands of this life whatever they may be because we are your children And we desire intimacy with the Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Number three. Jesus prioritized prayer over the expectations of others. Jesus prioritized prayer over others' expectations of him. The disciples came looking for him. It's interesting because the Greek word for they were searching for him is the word to hunt or to track down. It can often mean to hunt and track down with um, a sense of hostility or franticness. So get the picture here. They wake up and Jesus is missing. We got to find him. People are already outside the house looking for him, waiting for healing, needing demons to be cast out. Where is Jesus? We can't find him. And they, they, they frantically look for him. It's like they're, they're tracking down some animal that's gone missing, some dog that got out and has run away. And when they finally get to him, they say, everyone is looking for you. What were they expecting? They were expecting that Jesus would go back to where everyone was who were looking for him. They expected that Jesus, having done this great miracle-working moment in time of healing the sick and casting out those oppressed by demons, would seize this moment to extend his message, to cement his place as this notable, important figure. Certainly, Jesus, you're going to go back to the house. 
You're going to minister to the masses. You're going to do some more healing. You're going to do some more demon casting. And this is going to be fantastic. And Jesus looks at them and almost without even acknowledging the everyone that they're holding up. He says to them, well, let us go to the next towns. What, didn't you hear what we just said? We said, everyone is looking for you in the town we have been staying. Well, let's go to the next towns. I don't think you get it, Jesus. We're, we're talking about there's a crowd of people there to see you. Jesus knew that the crowds had come. He knew likely that the crowds were going to return. In fact, I believe he was a bit disheartened that all they really wanted was something from him. They didn't want him. You know, we could probably park the car right there and spend the rest of our time. But we've turned Christianity into, hey God, we need something from you. We don't really need you. We need answers from you, but we don't really want you. We're, we're coming to you for an answer, but... We don't, let, let's skip all the, I need to sit here in your presence, just enjoy these moments with you. God, I'm on a time crunch here. Can you just tell me what I need to know and let me go? God, I need some provision. And I can't wait. I don't need to be waiting days on this. I don't need to be waiting minutes on this. I just, I just need to tell you what I need to tell you. I, I need this. I need my bills paid. I need food. I need a new job. I need some insurance. I need, need a new car. But that's what the crowd had come for. We need some healing. We need these demons taken care of. They wanted Jesus the miracle worker. They didn't want Jesus the savior. They wanted Jesus the faith healer. They didn't want Jesus the Lord of creation. They wanted Jesus who was going to have handouts for all of us. It's like Oprah. You get a car. You get a car. But we don't want you to ask anything us, of us, to require anything of us. Jesus knew that that's really what the crowd was looking for. And now his own disciples are coming out telling him to come back to that crowd. But Jesus has come out to pray knowing that the crowd expected certain things of him. Even his own disciples would expect certain things of him. And he came out to pray in spite of those expectations. He came out to prioritize prayer over those expectations. And friends, people have expectations of you. And it doesn't change if you're a pastor. When you become a pastor, people expect you to, you're going to be this kind of pastor. They have in their mind, you're going to be this kind of pastor. And the moment you're not this kind of pastor... All of a sudden, they're like, wait a minute, you were going to be this. Why are you this? We need you to be this. Get over here. <laughs> right? People have expectations of us. And then they don't meet our expectations and we're disappointed with them. We can even be bitter toward them or angry at them. But Jesus' disciples had expectations. The crowd had expectations. You're going to do this. Jesus, you're going to use this moment to rise in prominence in the land by healing these people and doing this work. The crowd, you're going to give us what we need you're going to give us the things that we've been longing for. You're going to work some miracles and do the supernatural for our benefit. And Jesus goes out and prays and says, I'm going to prioritize prayer over your expectations. Has somebody else's expectations of you kept you from being obedient to God? Has somebody's expectations of what your life will look like kept you from a habit of godly disciplines in your life? Has somebody's expectations that they have communicated to you kept you from spending the time with God to know and follow after him that he has redeemed you to enjoy? 
And this is where we need to pause and pray. Would you pray with me? And would you use this moment as you're bowing to pray to say, Father, I want to please you by meeting your expectation. Even if that means I disappoint others because I cannot fulfill theirs. I want to fulfill what you desire for me. Let's pray. And Father, we pray that we will fulfill the expectations that you have set out for us. That we would always do that which pleases the Father. God, I know none of us want to be a disappointment to other people in our lives, but just as the disciples spoke to the religious leaders, whether we should obey you and meet your expectations or obey Christ and meet his expectations, you decide. But we can't help but to do that which is obedient to our Lord and Savior. Let us do that, Father. Let us desire to please you above all else and prioritize the things that matter most even when others don't understand or may be disappointed that we didn't do what they thought would be best for us to do. Amen. Number four, before we move into our groups, Jesus prioritized prayer for the sake of the mission. Isn't it interesting that Jesus has spent this previous day ministering to the multitudes? He goes out early in the morning to pray. And when the disciples come in and say there are demands and there are expectations and you need to get back to the house, Jesus says, let's go somewhere else. Why was Jesus going to go somewhere else? Well, Mark is clear. Let us go to the next towns that I may preach there also. Caruso is the Greek word, preach. To herald good news. Jesus said, I came to preach and proclaim the good news of the kingdom. I came to preach the gospel of salvation. I came to declare to the spiritually bankrupt that there is an eternal treasure that can be theirs through God's Lamb who has come to take away the sin of the world. Jesus came to preach the good news, and he tells this to the disciples, we're going to go to the other towns, the next towns, and everywhere else because I'm going to preach, for that is why I came. I didn't come just to be a miracle worker, a healer, a supernatural embodiment. I, I came to bring the good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to give sight to the blind, to give liberty to the captives. I came to preach the gospel of salvation. And that's why I came. And why is it that Jesus is saying this now? Because he spent the night ministering and then he spent the early morning praying. And in those moments of communication and intimacy with the Father, Jesus once again was affirmed and aligned with the Father's will. God sent the Son into the world. The Father had a mission for the Son. And Jesus in prayer was being affirmed again. Your mission is to make clear the good news. Your mission is to make clear the proclamation of the gospel for all to hear. So Jesus is coming out of prayer, and the prayer was his prioritization of a moment so that he would stay in clear alignment with the Father and his mission. You and I will get off mission when we get out of prayer. And we need to be on mission he has given us the mission of making disciples. He has called us into relationship with himself that we would be disciples 
who are making disciples through the proclamation of the good news. And we should be as eager and passionate about making sure that we're going to other towns and places and people to get that good news there as Jesus was in this moment. And Jesus here comes to this out of prayer. Jesus prioritized prayer for the sake of the mission. He constantly was going to the Father because, God, I want my heart to be your heart. I want my thoughts to be your thought. I don't want to deviate from what you sent me here to do. And if you sent me here to seek and to save the lost through proclaiming the gospel of salvation, I need to be about that. And out of prayer from that early morning time, Jesus said, I can't stay here. We've got to go there. Because I've got to preach the good news. Shouldn't that be our prayer for Calvary Baptist Church? Jesus, this isn't about making a name for ourselves. This isn't about filling more seats and getting people inside. Unless it's about making disciples. This isn't about how many ministries we can run. How big our budget is. If we just have a lot more dollars to spend on ourselves, then we'll have a lot more to give an account for, and it won't be good at the day of judgment. Jesus, this is about us having ministries that matter, having a mission that is on target, of making sure that the gospel is at the heart of who we are and what we do. Jesus, we're praying. We're using our times of prayer to pray that we'd be aligned with the mission. How many of our prayers are about the mission of seeing people who are lost be found? How many of our prayers are about people who are not disciples of Jesus become followers who passionately desire to to walk in obedience to him? How many of our prayers are actually going to impact eternity? And this is where we're going to pause and pray, but we're going to do it with each other. There is a prayer card there. And those prayer requests are significant and important. And sharing with each other the ways that we can pray for one another is important. But before you do anything else, Would you just take a moment, even if you get into a group and it's just one person who prays for our church body to be intimately, completely aligned with the Father's will and mission. Would you do that? So will you quickly gather into your groups, spend our remaining minutes, about six, seven minutes remaining, in prayer now with one another about the mission and for each other.